Myself, I'm John Bold, Minister here at Unity in Action. And without any further time delay, I'd like to turn our meeting this morning over to our special guest here, who is William Samuel. I think he likes to be called Bill. And he is an author, a truth teacher, and a mystic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> this reminds me of an Alabama Baptist revival meeting. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> You know, let's say that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, I want to check if I'm doing good. Oh. I think you're doing a good job. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was gracious. And uh, this whole, uh, I'm, I must say, uh, this is my first time in Canada. Oh. Rachel, Rachel has been to Canada. I've flown over it and I've sailed by it, but I've never been in it. And, uh, I'm tremendously impressed. We came in at Eastern British Columbia, and I thought we had mountains in Alabama. In fact, I thought we had mountains in, in Colorado and places like that, and now I have seen mountains. Rachel, Rachel said when we left home she wanted to get in the mountains and see them and enjoy them. She went to school in the Colorado mountains. And to date, we have seen something like 2,312 mountains. <laughs> and we've climbed half of them. <laughs> uh, you'll have to excuse my hyperbole. I don't know how many mountains we've seen, but we've seen an awful lot of them. I am now an expert on mountains. And I'm an expert on driving through mountains. <laughs> and I'm an expert on the rear end of recreational vehicles that drive slowly through the mountains. <laughs> uh, you folks bear with me because I'm, you've all attended things like this and you know that it takes a time to get started. It, it seems it takes a time to get personality out of the way. And if I might express a, a, a wish at the very beginning. I would appreciate it very much, those of you who have studied the words of William Samuel and have found any measure of light or grace or, or anything in them, that you please not allow 
what you see <laughs> at the front of the room to come between that and the grace you found in the Word. The proclivity, the human proclivity of all of us is to judge the philosophy by the teacher, to judge the, the uh, philosophy by the minister or by the practitioner or by the congregation. And it, it doesn't work that way. For myself, I found that it simply doesn't work that way. This would be tantamount to judging the works of Shakespeare by the quill he used. And incidentally, a true story, I'm told it's a true story, and you folks from Canada might know more about it than, than I do, but some years ago, I'm told that a tourist stole one of Shakespeare's quills at Stratford stole it, took it as a souvenir when no one was looking. And it was a, a, came from a pile of quills he used in writing one of his plays. And, and when it was noted at the end of the day, the British police were notified immediately. The insurance company was notified immediately that insured all the artifacts. Uh, it created an immediate stir. All the, uh, the names that had been registered there at Stratford during the day were recorded and checks were run immediately. All of these people were tracked down wherever they happened to be in England. They stopped the airplanes. That's just to remind me. <laughs> I won't tell you what it's to remind me of. Uh, they stopped the airplanes and they stopped the trains and they even uh, checked a boat that was departing for France, but they never found the quail. Now all of this stir over a quail, the tangible thing that you see with your eye, that one could say, this is the very quail Shakespeare used to write a play. Now, where I come from, we raise lots of turkeys. I understand you do up here too. Uh, and at Christmas and at Thanksgiving and at the various holidays, we, uh, we eat, we celebrate with a big turkey dinner. And uh, there must be 10,000 quills from every turkey. And so it, it would seem strange that just a single quill is selected of all the quills that exist in the world to say this is valuable, this is meaningful. And I suppose if the quill had been bent and twisted, there could be those that would say, well, Shakespeare really didn't have it at all. It just sounded like he had it because the quill or the quality of the quill. So I, I remind you that what appears seated in the front of the room is not the authority here at all. Uh, I really don't know how to say it without uh, sounding as though I'm deprecating a personal sense of self but I am deprecating a personal sense of self. The authority is not at the front of the room. The authority is the very awareness, the very life that one is that is presently listening, that is presently being. And that's where the authority lies. And it doesn't lie with any of the images that appear within awareness. Now, this can be the cause for great argument. Years back, when uh, I went through the period of first, I had the questions from the theological schools and then later from the various schools of philosophy because they wanted various statements supported and they wanted to see the reason and logic that stood behind. This was one of the first things that was challenged, the statement that the authority doesn't lie with the instructor, it doesn't lie with the encyclopedia, it doesn't lie with the, with the teacher. It doesn't lie with the philosophy, the religion. But rather, authority lies with life or awareness or consciousness that is perceiving. And awareness is always about the business of just simply perceiving. I see familiar faces, folks that have, that have visited with me before. And for the time being, as we get underway, I will address those people. There are some here who've made it all the way to Alabama. And uh, 
bit by bit as the pendulums stop swinging and as we stop our concern with who's saying what and does he look like the words <laughs> and uh, why is he botching the king's english like that and why doesn't he sit straighter and why is he nervous and all of that subsides uh, a bit of new communication can take place Once, a very lovely lady whose books I had enjoyed for many years, a lady by the name of Lillian de Waters, I found out she was still around and still having guests occasionally. And so I was on the telephone immediately and with a request to study with her. And her reply was no. She gave a reason, but I wasn't pleased with the reason. I said, well, uh, it's just absolutely essential that I come and study with you. And to make that story short, she refused and made the request that I not allow, as she put it, gray hair, wrinkles, and stooped shoulders to come between myself and the beauty I saw in her work. Well, I now realize how beautiful that instruction was and how meaningful it was. I know how much it has meant to me over the years because I've had the opposite of that experience. And I'm saying all of this now so that we might just settle down and get down to business in a few minutes. I remember reading a book once that impressed me mightily when I was a young fellow. And the words of it were most majestic and uh, inspiring. And I pictured the author of those words, uh, certainly a, a knight on a white horse. And he had been that to me. And it seemed that he had been that to, to many. Well, <laughs> some years later, I had an opportunity to go to a place and North Carolina as a guest where this gentleman was to be the speaker. And I went and I looked around, couldn't find my knight on the white horse anywhere. And finally someone told me, that's him up there at the head of the table, that little short fat fellow with a bald head. <laughs> and what I saw didn't match the words at all. And then when he began to talk, what he said didn't match the words either. And I was mightily disappointed. And I think I went for a couple of three years before I read any more of his words because I allowed the sight, the action, the mannerisms, the way he ate, and everything else to come between the truth of his words and myself. So I know that it is a human proclivity to do that. And I would like, at the very offset, since we didn't have a preparatory hour, we're just pitching right in and going to have a, a meaningful and meatful day. Uh, I want to put all of that to rest. I would like to tell one other story that's true, or I'm told it is. A lady who had a business in Paris had been uh, had become a vegetarian and had gone for a period of a couple of years and had nothing but uh, but orange juice to drink. Her entire diet was orange juice, but that was only part of her religious discipline. She had many other things going as well. But she heard of a Sufi teacher in the Middle East who had the unusual capacity to answer questions with words. That is, answer questions so the reason and logic of the intellect could understand and so that one could walk away with a what to do firmly lodged within. So she wrote the Sufi teacher her two questions and requested a visit. His reply was, yes, you can visit, but you must come with no strings, no attachments, no personal binds at all. If you have a business or anything like that, get rid of it because you'll be worrying about your business. 
uh, and you won't hear the answer. So she did. She sold her business in, in France. Now imagine the sacrifice such a thing takes. She really did it. She was sincere enough and earnest enough to do it. There's one young man in here who really came all the way to Mountain Brook, Alabama, which has to be the end of the world, almost. Even in the United States, that's considered the rear end of the United States. Well, she did it. And when she arrived at uh, wherever it was, Ankara, I think, she uh, called and was told to come out immediately. She would be just in time for dinner. And she, when she arrived, uh, she was greeted and ushered right into the dining room and placed at the table that was piled high with every kind of delicacy you can imagine. And there sat the teacher, the Sufi teacher, the guru or whatever you want to call him, uh, with an assortment of wines in front of him, an assortment of meats. Pork was there too, a, a roast pig with an apple in its mouth. And uh, this lady, mind you, had had orange juice only for the last two years. So she was horrified. Right. Why was she horrified? Well, it was contrary to her discipline. She was hearing and seeing things that uh, didn't jihaw with her intellectual concept of what the truth is, nor, but especially, that the so-called purveyor of truth who sat there at the head of the table, wasn't acting as she felt he should act. He was eating pork. And uh, so during the course of the dinner, the Sufi answered her two questions in detail. Then a little bit later on in the meal, he said, now it, it, it just happens that very often when, when people want to hear answers, they are so preoccupied with other thoughts and ideas that they don't hear it, so therefore I'm going to answer your questions again. And he answered them the second time. And when the meal was over and she was leaving, she said to the teacher, uh, you were very kind to have me for dinner, and I'm very grateful, and what time can I see you tomorrow? And he said, why do you want to see me tomorrow? And she said, because I've traveled all this distance to ask two questions, and uh, I want to come back for the answers. And the old teacher, I'm told, just shook his head and said, you've heard them already. And in quiet moments, when you're very still and very quiet, you will hear it again. But I answered your questions tonight twice. Now, I can, I can believe that's true because I know for myself how many times I, I heard the answer. I know for myself how many times I saw the simple truth right in front of me, shining like a diamond. I know how often I felt the grand joy that the purpose of all religion and philosophy metaphysics is really, really for. I know how often it was about without any recognition on my part at all, without any acknowledgement of it, because I was busy looking for something else. I used to go to lectures, every one I could go to, and to teachers, every one I could find, or anyone that had the promise of any, any wisdom. And uh, I was so busy expecting a, and I, I mean no offense if I should appear to be hammering at a specific idea because I, I just have to use words, but I, in, in looking for a grand illumination that I did myself determine to be a road to Damascus thing in which I would simply be dumbfounded, stricken blind, and I would look up and all things would be new. But looking for that, I didn't hear the honest statement about illumination. Uh, a gentleman from, well, I best not identify too carefully, but a, a gentleman who had just sold a business for many million dollars 
came to visit me in Mountain Brook at Woodsong. And he had taken the many million dollars that he had received from the sale of his business and had put it in the stock market. And, and uh, the stock market was not faring well in those days. It was back during this, the recession that uh, a few years back. It was, I'm told, very severe. And, uh, and he was much distraught. He said, every day I'm losing thousands of dollars. Some days I'm losing hundreds of thousands of dollars just because the stock market is falling. And he said, now what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm asked questions like that all the time. I'm not a financial advisor, you know. I don't know what he... But I am certain that, that there is an answer to any question that can be proposed and, and that while answers don't come from, from me, that is, from this, wisdom is present, that is, Intelligence is present. This very moment, folks, and this, this is an aside, but an important one. Right now, right here, right where we are, infinite wisdom is present. Because God is present. That is, that which is being life is here. This instant, being life. Else there'd be no life present here. The ineffable whatever it is that some people call God is here, this instant, being this life we are. Consequently, wisdom is here, intelligence is here. Well, I made some statement like that to this gentleman about his dollars, and, but it had just happened that the evening before I had had two strange phone calls, both from, from uh, our capital. Uh, one was from a gentleman who had been many years in the CIA, and uh, he said, Bill, you have been a gracious help of plenty to me over the years. I would like to be a help to you now. He said, if you have any securities or any, anything like that, it would be grand if you would start buying metal. And I said, what in the world do you mean by that? And he said, you know, buy coins, buy silver, buy gold. Well, gold then was $40 an ounce. And uh, I thanked him kindly and said, I'm glad you think of me in terms of having something like that, but I don't. What song is But, uh, well, I had had that call, and then, lo and behold, the same evening, a lady who had studied and had been to Mount Brook many times called to make the same statement, that she and her husband were selling everything they had and were buying gold. Well, then the next day comes this gentleman with his tale of wool about the stock market, and uh, then I began to tell him about my two phone calls, and I said, surely they were for a reason, and apparently the reason was just so I could pass that information on to you. Perhaps the thing you can do is uh, buy metal. Uh, am I boring you people with tales like this? Because we will get on. Is this all right? Well, uh, he spent the usual two and a half days at Woodsong, and, and we talked about it at, at great length. Uh, he laughed, apparently very much elated, pleased, seeming to know what course of action to take. Well, within six months, I had a, a phone call from this same gentleman, and he was all distraught, and he said, uh, I still haven't resolved my problem. The market is still going down and I'm losing thousands of dollars every day. And I said, but we had a long discussion about it. Did you, did you consider or examine the possibility of, of buying metals? Uh, that seemed to be the solution that came while you were here. And he said, we didn't talk about buying metals or buying gold. And yet, folks, we had for two days in fact, for more than two days. That's what we discussed. Well, on the telephone, I had to reconvince him that that's what we had talked about. At that time, gold had gone up to about $80. And I remember Rachel and I commenting just shortly before his phone call came that we wondered what had happened to his many millions if they had doubled or not. Well, I, there was a conversation. He seemed to be reconvinced on the telephone. Well, now I understand gold is $340 an ounce, and I wonder if his fortune has quadrupled. I haven't heard. But I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't hear, 
if you didn't hear it then. So there is this disposition within us that acts like a mist that covers the whole face of the ground. It acts like a glass through which one sees dimly. The causes of it, oh, if we're looking for causes, it would seem that the causes of it are the seven cardinal sins that the Bible speaks of. Envy certainly colors one's view of the world. Greed does. Jealousy does. But it's possible to lay all that aside and hear clearly and see as we're seeing. And I know that it can be put aside however briefly, in order to hear what's necessary to be heard. And I suspect that that will happen during this day to day. If I may, I'll, I would like to say this. I don't come out and talk very often. Uh, and all of you will... will if you don't already understand why, one day you will fully understand why. Because again, certainly the authority isn't the one <laughs> that's talking, and it isn't the one in the front of the room, and it does seem difficult sometimes to cast yourself in a role, it's purely a role, but in which it would appear that one is acting like the authority or like the one who knows. So I don't come out and, and talk very often, but, but when I do, there is a mysterious and wonderful thing that, that follows. And it certainly doesn't follow because of Bill Samuel. It follows because awareness is listening, present, and is itself, the God self it is, fully cognizant of itself, joying in itself, knowing itself. The thing that follows these experiences is that I'll just have to use the words best I can. It, it seems that people hear and answers are answered. Loose ends are tied together. And some aspect or some part of this, what appears to be the grand mystery of truth, is less mysterious. That happens. But more than that, the experience. Receiving will happen during this day. And I, I say that with, 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 uh, with all the authority in the world, because I've been watching it. Now, with that grandiose statement, very bombastic, I would like to perhaps lay uh, an intellectual statement on top of it that will explain it a bit. There has always been present everywhere the ability to communicate beyond words, beyond the intellect. But the very nature of us, and with all of our studious upbringing, we have been geared to listen to lectures with the intellect of, of us, the reason and logic of us. And uh, if things do tie up and come together, if some loose strings are thrown together, and if a little glimmer of light here or there breaks through, we say, that is a good talk. How many times I've, I've left lectures from where a real inspiring lecturer has left me floating and I'm walking on air and I'm, I'm filled with new enthusiasm and I say, that was a good talk. Well, it might have been the worst one I've ever been to as far as, as what was necessary goes because very often the inspirational talk was a talk that was elevating or energizing or supporting my old ideas and opinions. And I suppose I can put my finger on, on quite a number of talks that I left thinking what a terrible mess that was and how wrong that was and what a bombastic, foolish uh, harangue that was when in in fact, what had taken place was the crushing of many preconceived notions of mine. 
and I was arguing with the discomfort the old nature of me felt with having some of its cherished idols taken away. So some of that will transpire here too. But there's a way to do that. I'm sure all of you have attended lectures where uh, the brutal treatment was given. If ever you've gone to an old Pentecostal meeting in the South, you would know how the table is pounded and how the threats of hellfire and damnation are thrown out and uh, it, it becomes a very frightening experience. Or if you've perhaps heard metaphysicians who with a very absolute line would leave one with would chop the entire table of reason and logic out from under one so that there was nothing left. And it's a very discomforting feeling and often works obversely in the affairs of people. Instead of, of examining those ideas, one often in his discomfort goes rushing back to the old ideas of conventional belief because it was more comfortable. Well now, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is there is a, a way that one can communicate beyond word. And all of you know it already and are familiar with it. You've heard the statement, I'm sure, that comes from Eastern theology that he who knows doesn't speak and he who speaks about it doesn't know about it. You've heard that. And the reasons for that statement, you all know, are intellectually sound, metaphysically sound. It would, it would seem, for instance, that, I, and I'll here use just plain old metaphysical uh, approach. I say the plain old metaphysical approach. It's, it's most necessary that one understand that in thinking in terms of infinity, beginning with an infinite Godhead, beginning with an infinite ineffable being life, we would Think of God then as omnipresent, as omniscient, and as absolutely illimitable. Well, when we think of words, and Dr. Don's attempt to, to minister or to talk about some aspect of the truth, we know that the words that are used, the words all of us use, are man-made. Words themselves are limited and finite while they might well be intangible until they're written down or sounded, they're still finite because no single word, nor all of them together for that matter, can encompass infinity. So we can see the metaphysical reason and logic that stands behind the statement that he who really has experienced the infinite experience, and by the way, we all have. You're experiencing it this minute, perhaps not consciously, so you know what's going on, but it's happening. And that's all that's happening, is truth outing. Well, we can see then that, that uh, the attempt to encompass it in words and talk about it is virtually impossible. But yet, we can talk beyond words, and we often do, in very simple ways. The dirty look that uh, the wife gives her husband is uh, an, a not an expression of words, but it certainly says it a great deal. The, the so-called body English of a few years back when people studied that, uh, we know that it says so much more than words. But let's, let me get down to what will be happening today. I've learned to use overtone. And I best explain that because I don't want anything going on here that isn't completely intellectually understood. Intellectually understood. In the process of telling a story such as I've already told a half dozen, in the process of telling a story, every story rings a bell inside one. And it is tantamount to a tone, it's heard. When we read a parable in the Bible, one of the stories of the Old Testament, even if we've read it a thousand times, it rings a bell inside or a tone is sounded. Sometimes they're mellow. Incidentally, those tones are often influenced by our experience. There's no way they would not be influenced by experience. If the first time one had ever heard the 23rd Psalm, he'd 
He was in a dire strait without a penny in his pocket and a stack of bills in front of him and he didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And then under those circumstances he heard the word, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Well, it would be pretty hard if for many, many years thereafter, every time he heard the 23rd Psalm, the overtone or the feeling, the tone that came with that was not accompanied with some of the feeling of those impoverished days and the anguish of that moment. And especially of the relief, perhaps, that the 23rd Psalm offered. So, okay, does everyone understand what I mean? How a story... And by the way, if you were to go to the Middle East and study with the Sufis that I mentioned, all they do is tell stories. And they tell the same story. The same one. Over and over. If you studied with a Sufi master for 20 years, you would hear his same stories over and over. But you wouldn't hear them in the same order. And you wouldn't hear them, you wouldn't hear them uh, told precisely the same at any time. And why not? Because with each listening, well, the order is clear because he put them in another order, as he told them. But, but as far as the tone goes, you're listening each time to another set of circumstances. All right, now, during the course of the day, I will be sounding, I will be telling stories. Well aware that the story produces a, a tone or feeling within. The tone and feeling that, that, that I would, that, it, that I'm concerned about is that I make the, the story as absolutely honest as I can make it. Because it'll be my own story, it'll be a story I've lived. And it will be, uh, told using words that will keep it as straight as possible and I'm assuming that there is an out there to interpret those stories when actually that's not so at all but I will be attempting to operate as though there is an out there to listen and to interpret or misinterpret the story and I will do everything I can to preclude any misinterpreting but now I would like to ask you a question. When, when one note on the piano is sounded, let's say that's tantamount to a story, and then another note is sounded, and the, two, the, the tone of one still lingers in the room when the second note is struck, what is the product? It's very simple. There's a third tone that has never been put into words at all. It's an overtone. All musicians know about the overtone. If a chord is struck, a bombastic series of notes, and then another chord is struck higher up on the piano, a bombastic chord above, while the soft pedal is still on and the, the two tones mingle, there will be the third sound. Now, it wasn't necessary with the third sound to actually strike the piano to do that. That is, let's put it back, back to the words again. One story involved words, tangible, finite words that are constructed by the intellect and addressed to the intellect so that it makes reasonable, logical sense to the intellect. All right? Then another story is told, again, using finite, tangible words, hopefully as honestly stated. Now, but the overtone, the combination of the two tones together produces a third clearly perceived, but without words, and without any reason or logic connected with it, without all of the building blocks that we feel intellectually are necessary before a talk is a good talk, before a lecture is a good lecture. Uh, so I will be doing that. And uh, the overtones, how, do, how, does it, how does it work in our affairs? Well, we've all experienced this a million times. You know, when you've read Charles Dickens, you've read a whole book full of overtones. When you read Shakespeare, you have. Uh, when you read the good poets, you have. Why, the, the, a poet, quite without realizing it intellectually, when he wants a strong, strong statement, he might precede it with an entire page of the softest sounds you can imagine. And then comes the bombastic sound, and because it was preceded with a very soft sound, the 
bombacity is twice as loud. Or he might wish to make a point that is so subtle, or he might unwittingly be making a point that is much too subtle for words, quite beyond the reason and logic of the intellect. So a page is filled with, with the bombacity, like, oh, perhaps Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, an American poet who seemed to hack his perfect pentameters out of granite, slowly and meticulously, but but then would follow a soft statement, a statement so soft, made twice as soft because of the noise that preceded it. Now, is there any questions? Now, this has been going on, you know, all good. I think we all do this intuitively, instinctively. But this time, uh, we're doing it with a conscious knowledge of what will be transpired. But we'll not be lost now in, the, in thinking about it. Let me tell you how I would like to have the remainder of the talk, and then we'll take a break. But I would like to have you just listen gently now, not with the intellect, but be very, very gentle with yourself. Once upon a time, I wrote a story that happened for me. It was about an early morning walk that I took. I got up early in the morning and walked out into the Alabama woodland and it was in the, in the fall and the leaves had begun to fall and those on the trees were all brightly colored and my pathway was covered with leaves so as I walked the leaves crunched underfoot. And the fall is a very lovely time of year anyway because you know fall is the time of coming home, it's the time of returning. Fall is the time for the prodigal's return. This is fall right now. We are coming home. That's what's going on here. We're coming back to the beginning. But this time to stay there. So a fall walk is a very, very wonderful walk. And that morning as I was walking along and smelling that crisp air that we don't have. You seem to have it here all the time. It's crisp and lovely here. Fantastic. Oh, well. No, no, it hasn't. We haven't seen rain in a month, I don't think. But anyway, I, there I was walking, and I, the leaves were crunching underfoot, and, and then as I got into the forest part of it, uh, the light was coming through that early morning light that slants at such a deep angle, and there was still mist on the trees and occasionally drops of dew would fall and it would go right through one of those slanting things of light and it would sparkle like a diamond just for a minute and this is an enthralling sight to see and i was walking along enjoying just enjoying just being no motive in mind just being and as i went around a curve i happened on a deer and i frightened the deer now I didn't see the deer until the deer had been frightened and it went jumping away. It leapt right out of my way. I was almost a topping. And the deer went running through all of those leaves in a zigzag path as they've learned to run and it disappeared and, and that's quite a thrill, I think. It's a, it's a shock and it's a thrill, but now it, it sends uh, a tingle up your back because you don't happen on nature like that. That kind of unbound, unlimited freedom of the forest, you don't walk right up to them so often. And I remember the excitement of the minute. And then I thought, I'd like to write about that. I'd just like to tell it. And I did. But I likened, I likened the one who would write about such an event to a woodcarver. And I, I said, so imagine now a woodcarver who would take a piece of uncarved wood and his mission now is to carve into that wood the event of the morning. The smell of the fresh air, the crispness, the, the way the, the dew looks when it 
goes through the slanting sunlight, the sound of the leaves underfoot, the smell of the fresh earth, the sound of, of the morning, and then the deer. Imagine carving all that into a piece of wood. But doing it so that one who picks up the piece of wood and examines it gets the entire story. Well, how can a woodcarver do such a thing? Is it possible? He might carve a beautiful deer. He might carve even the whole scene of the forest. But is he going to be able to get the, the, the joy, the, the soft sound of morning sunlight? Can he do that too? Can he get the freshness of the earth? Well, maybe if he selects the right wood, he can. But no, I think you would all agree that the finiteness of the wood, no matter how noble the effort, it's impossible to, in reasonable, logical, tangible terms, make the full statement of that morning. Now, I wrote that story a long time ago. And of course, it was addressed to the difficulty And really, to the, to the arrogance of those who would put themselves in the front of a room and profess to be talking about an infinite, illimitable, boundless, <laughs> that's kind of redundant, isn't it? Godhead. And yet, and yet, and yet, it isn't possible to say anything or talk about anything without talking about qualities and attributes of the ineffable. Well, that was what that story was for. Well, let me tell you another one that is in the process of being written. Let me take you for another walk. And let's say this one happened this morning. And let's say that all of us, and by the way, a lot of years have passed, and so we're walking more slowly now as we walk through the woods. And we're not climbing the hills that we climbed before. We're walking around them. And this time, maybe I... My walking stick, I've always carried a stick, but I carry a heavier one now because I seem to lean on it a lot more. And so we walk more slowly, and over the years we've become intimately acquainted with the woodland, and this time we know the bird song. Now, I don't know how many of you people love birds, but it's almost impossible not to love them. Birds are angels. I'm sure they are. They're freedom their lightness and grace. And we've learned over the years to, to learn the bird songs. Down in Alabama, we got a lot of them. And, and then there was always a special thrill when we would hear the bird song and later be able to connect it with the bird we saw, put the two together, so that you'd just hear the sound, you could say, ah, cardinal. Or you'd hear the sound and you could say, that is an English sparrow. Or that's titmouse with its raucous peep, little bird with a big mouth. Well, now here we are, we're taking a walk, just like the one before when we frightened the deer. We're listening to the morning, and the morning is filled with all kinds of bird songs, and it's a morning just like this morning. The air is moist, the leaves are crisp, and we're hearing all of the sounds of the, of the, of the forest, when all of a sudden, it's quiet. I'm sure all of you have, have noticed sudden moments of quiet. Some of us pick that up and, and perceive it in a minute, and others, it, it dawns on us more slowly. But finally, the quiet is noticed. And here, all of a sudden, the forest is dead quiet. There isn't a sound anywhere. And I think that you will agree that when the forest gets quiet, the people walking through it get quiet, too. And we stop. And in the midst of all that quiet, all of a sudden comes a new bird song. It's a twitter and a warble and a peep. We've never heard it before. And it's loud, piercing, penetrating. A twitter and a warble and a peep. Let me ask you, at this moment, do you ask yourself, 
Is that a good bird song or a bad bird song? You don't do that, do you? We just listen. We just listen. Do we ask ourselves, is that a helpful bird song or a hurtful bird song? No. We just listen. Do we ask ourselves, is it a, uh, well, the point I guess I'm trying to make, and perhaps poorly, is that if for the remainder of the day you will listen to what follows and to the answers that come to the questions, if you will just listen, just listen, without, any, without running it through an intellectual sieve of, is it good? Is it bad? Don't run it through a, a sieve of does it make sense or does it not make sense? But just listen. Now, if it makes sense, and hopefully it will, that'll just be lanyap. It'll be extra. It'll be uh, the added thing. Someday, the, the seminal idea will be said so well, if it's said, that there won't be any questions about its accuracy or inaccuracy, its rightness or wrongness. It'll just be said so well, it'll be heard and listened to. And its healing will be carried on its way. Joy will come with it. A sense of inner yes will come with it. Because what I have to say is so simple that it has to be, and to use David Manners, perhaps you've read his work, an old friend of Rachel's and mine. He says, it has to be complicated up a little bit, doesn't it, Bill, before anybody will pay any attention to it. It has to be <laughs> mystified just a little bit. But it's because what I'll have to say is very simple. Now, it's also very obvious. I, you've heard this story. Any of you have heard any of my old talks or anything? There, in the tradition of the East, there's a story that Buddha was saying about the truth, this basic truth, it was so simple and it seemed to be naked and raw and that it could be abused and people would use it for crutches and they would, uh, and so forth, or to use the Christian terminology, it could be trampled underfoot. And so Buddha was saying, now what shall we do with this truth so it won't be abused by those who are, who think they understand, but they're using it as a crutch or they're using it to make a human sense of self or a personal sense of self more comfortable that, uh, that those who would take the dream and perpetuate the dream and prolong the dream with it rather than allow the truth to end the dream or at least explain why the dream seems. And so one of his disciples said, well, Lord Buddha, we will take this uh, truth and we will uh, take it out and hide it among the stars of the Pleiades because mankind will never get out there to find it. And Buddha said, no, he'll find it there. And then another disciple said, well, we'll take it and we'll put it in the deepest part of the ocean. It'll never be found there. And Buddha said, no, it'll be found there. And so his disciple said, well, for goodness sake, what shall we do with it, Lord Buddha? And do you remember his, his reply? He said, we will clothe it in simplicity and childlikeness. And no one, no one will ever find it there. Now, within the Christian tradition is the statement, lest ye become as children. I can tell you this, the child of us lives, the child of us is right now alive, undiminished, healthy, wealthy, without any need 
it is present here and now. And as the child, what does a child do when it hears a bird sound? <laughs> he just listens and enjoys it. When a frog croaks, he listens with all of his might. He just listens. He doesn't say, is it right? Is it wrong? Does it agree with all of my philosophic upbringing or not? Just listen. Let's all take a minute to rest and a couple of minutes, stand up and stretch break and maybe get a cup of coffee to, and then we will resume.